Meine Damen und Herren, es geht weiter mit unserer Nachmittagssession. Ich hoffe, Sie sind alle gut gestärkt und geatzt und äh, haben, noch, haben genügend Energie für einen langen Nachmittag. Es kommt ja noch einiges auf uns zu. Ich darf Ihnen als nächstes ankündigen einen Vortrag mit dem Titel Principles and Quality of Effectiveness of SKIO System. Der Vortrag wird gehalten von Professor Bill Nelson aus Budapest. Professor Nelson ist hier durch Sponsoring der Firma SKIO in Europa. Das ist die Wellness Trust AG in der Schweiz, die Familie Heiliger. Professor Nelson wird sich selbst vorstellen. Ich kann mich deswegen äh, kurz halten und zurückziehen. Ich darf damit das Wort an Professor Nelson geben. Please, Professor Nelson, go ahead. Hello. Guten Tag. Excuse me, but my presentation is in English. I want to talk about opening up with false beliefs. We find that people will cling to false beliefs very violently. They'll be talking, and when people, their belief systems are attacked, they get very, very violent. I'm going to talk about a number of them that need to happen in this world. First, 7 to 10 percent of the population is born left-handed. It happens. Most people will prefer the choice of the right hand, but some people develop a preference for the left hand. It's a preference. 7 to 10 percent. The choice of handedness does not take place in the hand. The choice of handedness takes place in the brain. It happens here, not here. Seven to ten percent of the people are born with cross-gender feelings. I was born with an extra chromosome and found out later in life that I'm male and female. To most people, seven to ten percent of the people of the, of the world are born with cross-gender ideas. A man might want a man, a man might feel like a woman, a woman might want a woman. This just happens. A long time ago, we used to kill the left-handed people because they were different. Then we said, oh no, they're just people. Seven to 10 percent of the people are born with this, and the choice of sexual preference does not take place in the little head. It takes place in the big head. This is a simple, because in America especially, the, the, the idea is that the choice of sexuality takes our place in the little head. If you have one, as I grew up, I had to be male. It wasn't until later with my wife and my family in Budapest that she said, no, you, she says, you feel more female. Be female. So I just wanted to help put you at ease with that. Next, a big thing for our society. Synthetic compounds. Synthetic compounds are not compatible with the human body. I spell it S-I-N instead of S-Y-N. As a culture, we have learned to reject synthetic foods. If we go to a restaurant and it says synthetic wine, we do not choose that wine. We do not choose synthetic cheese. We have learned over the last hundred years that those synthetic compounds cause disease, cause cancer, create problems, they do not taste good, and when we want the finest quality of food, we go to the gourmet, and the gourmet cook will not use a synthetic compound. The gourmet cook will use natural and he knows the finest of the flavors and the most compatibility with the human body will come from the natural. This is also true for our, our medicines. The simple little story here. And basically, we have people who are trying to take that choice away. And when we expose that false belief that they think that the synthetic drugs can work, it creates problems. So I was hated in America by the medical companies. 
mostly the chemical companies, whose whole idea of medicine was all about selling, patenting a synthetic project, etc. When I first started working, I started to see, when I had gone to medical school, I started to see that the synthetic compounds didn't work, and my son Daniel was born 27 years ago. And he was autistic because of a drug. The first form of that drug was thalidomide, then was bendictine. Daniel was autistic. I started to research all of the different drugs and found out that their natural forms were better than their synthetic forms. In America, there was a law about cancer, and I had done research and found that chemotherapy was discovered by farmers. Certain plants, healthy animals would not eat, like the vinca. In America, we call it periwinkle, scientific name vinca. A healthy animal will not eat it because it is a low-grade poison. It is a chemotaxic agent inside it, and this chemotaxic agent will attack and poison cancer cells much more violently. The first form of chemotherapy comes from the vinca. They called it vincastrin, after the vinca. I wanted to study the natural. Nobody had ever studied the natural vinca because you can't patent nature. You can only patent the synthetic. Nobody wanted to invest in research on a natural, you can't patent it. In Kiev, I had the opportunity to do a whole host of studies on this, which we published in the journal, a whole bunch of ideas about the cancer and our treatment, everything around the nature, the natural. In America, there was a law in a room of more than three people it's illegal to express the opinion that something other than, than, than synthetic chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery could be helpful for cancer. It was illegal in America to discuss the study that we started doing in Kiev. And after three years, incredible results. Synthetic compounds do not work. And as I was able to prove more and more of that, I became more and more unpopular. Allopathy was next. The basic idea of allopathic medicine, treating a symptom, that's another false belief. Selye was a man, Selye, in Hungarian, the pronunciation is Selye, but Selye was a researcher who had an idea of medicine that stress will come into the body. Stress, when it comes into the body, will produce an alarm reaction. And the alarm reaction is the symptom, a cough, an itch, a pain, a symptom. After, after a while, if the stressor continues, the body will adapt. The symptom will go away, but the disease continues. It's called the second phase, the adaptation stage. You'll have a problem with gingivitis, but after a while, your body adapts. It stops the bleeding. The gingivitis continues. And later on, into exhaustion phase, into the final phase of exhaustion, then to death. This is the work of Selye. I was doing a lecture I must share with you in Denver, and I was lecturing about calcium metabolism. Calcium is a needed ion for our muscles to work, and if we get severely deficient in calcium, we go into tetany. We get into tightness. Tetanus, the bacteria, has a chemical that blocks calcium. This is why it goes into tetany. And if we get into extreme, tetanus is called lockjaw in America, because the jaw will lock. Tetany, if you get calcium deficient. The smallest muscle in the human body is inside the lung attached to the cilia. The cilia are little hairs inside your lung that have the tiniest muscle in the human body and they are constantly cleaning your lung. Everybody will be exposed to a minimum of 20 pounds to 20 kilos of dirt in their lungs every year and the cilia will clean them. 
If you are a little calcium deficient, the cilia are the first muscle to go tetany. And you no longer can clean your lung properly. I was doing the lecture, and a woman had a cough. Thank you. Had a cough there. Thanks. Another one. A little bit of potato chip. It, she, had this, she had this cough, and I said, let's give her some calcium. I gave her some calcium. About 30 minutes later, she coughed out a little bit of potato chip. She was watching television the night before. She was watching Freddy Krueger. And she, <gasps> she inhaled a small piece of potato chip. She aspirated a piece of potato chip. It was stuck in her lungs. She couldn't get rid of it because of the calcium deficiency. What would have happened if she was so unlucky, so misfortunate, that she would have went to a typical allopathic medical doctor? He would have prescribed a cough suppressant. The alarm reaction, the cough, would go away. The potato chip would stay. Later on, after the reduction of the symptom, later on a cyst would develop around there. That type of cyst tissue would be extra sensitive to toxins such as viruses or cigarette smoking and maybe go cancerous. What was the cause of that cancer later in life? The allopathic medical doctor, the cough suppressant, the calcium deficiency. And later on, when we test the patient on the machine, up comes the number one thing is potato chip. Cellier says the most important thing in medicine. Because the symptoms can go away and your body adapt to the stressor, the heavy metal, the toxin, the poison, the stress, all the, all the different types of things, the traumas, all this little thing. Your body can adapt and the symptom go away. You can be really sick and not know it. And the thing that we must realize is that lack of symptoms is not a measure of health. Allopathy cannot work as a system of medicine. And if we look into the synthetic drugs that they use, they are all designed to block function. MAO inhibitors, calcium blockers, antipyretics. They're all designed to interfere with the body natural, to attack a symptom, but not basically the disease. A whole symptom. Allopathy cannot work. Our bodies in this world must, we must be able to excrete in order to nourish. This is a law. We must be able to excrete. Everybody has a toilet, right? We must excrete. Everybody needs to do this. We excrete through the, through, uh, the stool, through the urine, through our sweat, through menses, through the skin, the, through the breath, all these different ways. We need to. We have an ever-increasingly toxic world as we are putting more and more chemicals into this as into this world. As we get more and more chemicals, as we get more and more toxins, we will have more excretions. Our bodies will want to excrete. And when we have that excess excretion, diarrhea, and uresis, sweating, etc., what would happen if you are so unlucky, so misfortunate, that you go to an allopathic medical doctor? He will see that excretion as the symptom, and he will attack it, and he will work on that. A little girl was seeing me in Budapest a couple, of, uh, a couple of months ago, and she was on her way to see the medical doctor. She's a friend of the family. And I said, why are you going to the doctor? Well, she says she sweats too much. She sweats too much. I said, well, you're 17 years old. You're about to graduate high school. You're trying to choose a college. You're also trying to choose a boyfriend. And you eat too much pig and salt. I think that your body, it's natural to sweat. She says, she's going to go to the medical doctor. He's going to give her a Botox injection to stop the sweat. I said, if you have diarrhea, will he sew up your ass?
the philosophy of their medicine is completely wrong. But when it comes as a false belief, especially when it's a person dressed in just like me, it's hard for them to take. They react. They want to shoot the messenger. We have another big problem in the world. The idea of whether we, do we have a local universe idea of push-pull, photons, gravity, cause-effect, or is there a non-local universe where the mind can affect things? Big debate in science. It's been proved. In quantum physics, we notice the observer effect. It's proved. The mind of the observer can affect the study. Well documented. In medicine, they had to go to the double blind because of the placebo effect. The mind of the researcher can affect the patient. The mind can't affect things. It was proven. Bell's theorem has recently been proven over the last 10 years that two twin photons can simultaneously, at the ends of the universe, sense each other without an electromagnetic connection. We have a non-local universe. It's been proven. And 99.9% .9 of the people of this world, if we had to vote tomorrow, will, will vote for a type of science where there is a God, a spirit, a connection. Everybody can tell stories how they thought of a friend and they call, or little things, there's a connection between mother, child. Everybody tells these stories. And yet we give all of our power on this planet to the people, all of our power to that 0.01%, the geek who wants to control the foods put on our, on, on our plate, control the chemicals in our environment. We have a non-local universe, and that has to be done. We need to take back this planet from those people because there is the powers of the mind, and it does work. Every time somebody exposes a false belief, they become unpopular to the people who hold that belief. I was able to see that subtle muscle control years ago. I was able to see that muscle testing and the point probe and these different things. I was one of the best point probe practitioners in the world. I traveled the world. But I was able to see that by the speed of the point probe, going in fast to get a high reading, going in slow to get a low reading, the therapist could interrupt on the process. That made me really unpopular in Germany. Sorry. I'll tell you a little story about my life. I'll try to go through this pretty quick. 1957, 50 years ago, Sputnik was launched. And I remember going out, and my grandfather and I, and Sputnik was purposely went over the United States to shake up the United States. And we would look up and he'd say, there it goes. I said, what is that? He said, that's a satellite. A satellite? What's that? And it's making noise. I can't hear it. No, it's making noise. It's making a radio signal. My grandfather and I, we constructed a ham radio to listen to Sputnik. And that was 1957. That was my first real electronic experience. I was seven years old. During my, my childhood, they called me Wunderkinder in America. They used that word, because I was a mathematical whiz kid with all these skills. 1967, I had actually written papers that were published on bioanalysis of blood. 1968, by the way, I was in the Olympics, uh, Mexico City in gymnastics, and also I had published a uh, had done a number one hit that is still one of the top 40 songs of all time with the human beings. <laughs> a little data. 1969, I was hired to work in the Apollo project. They had interviewed all kinds of, of kids to go into the school and to work as an electrical engineer and go to school, and I was hired. And I was real key, I was there, I was working on the day that number 11 landed. I supervised the harness and did the last testing of harness number 12, 13, and 14. And I was there when Apollo 13 had trouble. And they had laid people off and I was, and people were sick and I was the only one in the office that day when they called up and asked the question, can we turn off the gyro? 
It's a nice story, I don't have time to tell it, but yes, I, in fact, and then I was the one who helped program, did most of the work on reprogramming their re-entry. I dropped out of the engineering because I wanted to work with people, and they transferred me to work on bombs. I didn't want to work on bombs. I would have stayed if we would have stayed with the Apollo project, but we didn't. I got into medicine. As I got into medicine, I found out that there was the German energetic medicine of Dr. Vohl and the point probe. And I started working with it. And I got the Vohl test kits and all of this, and I became very good at it. I had gone into medical school, graduated in Neocom, Northeastern Ohio College of Medicine. 1982, I had written the book because I started to see that their idea of the body was based on a synthetic chemical analysis and based on a thermodynamic model. Thermodynamics is the laws of death, whereas quantum theories offered us an explanation for the laws of life. I wrote a book about this, 1,200 plus pages, known as the Promorpheus. Its first version was in the Library of Congress in the United States, 1982. It's been re-edited since. Vohr was working with just resistance, one channel. He was measuring a one-channel system per second. He would measure an item, measure a one-channel, get a reading per second. And I started recognizing as an electrical engineer that there was volts and amps. There was other electrical measures that could be made. You cannot measure an oscillation with resistance. It doesn't change. You can only measure oscillations through volts and amperage changes. So I started working with this. I had now had a three-channel system per second. Started working with this. And I had discovered the science of voltammetry, being able to look at different things in voltammetry. Started developing some of these things. Then the next question, what was the speed of reactivity of the human body? Vohl had found medication testing that people reacted to homeopathics, etc., other items. But what was the speed? We had found that since it was ionic exchange, the speed of ionic exchange in the human body is approximately a hundredth of a second. One hundredth of a second. We needed now a computer to make sure that we, I couldn't be that fast. One hundredth of a second. We needed a system, we needed a mechanism. I was trying to make a better technology. Gone from one channel to three channels. By 1987, by 1988, we now had a 10 channel system, one hundredth of a second. I was the first one to get NDC codes, National Drug Codes for Homeopathy in America. And by 1989, I had an FDA registration of an electrodiagnostic system to be able to measure the body as a biofeedback instrument to measure the body electric. In 1990, I had now built a, a therapy system. I was working with the BCOM people from, from Munich, Munich, and we had now a therapy system to work with. The FDA stepped in and they didn't like it because what I was developing was a non-drug therapy. They didn't like this. They wanted drug therapies. They didn't want people to be able to do electrical measures. They gave us trouble, etc. 1991, we were in Munich and we had seen that we could do therapy and check it. We could make a cybernetic loop to send energy into the body and see how the patient reacts at biological speeds. BCOM people didn't, uh, we made a deal, but they didn't live up to it. So I started doing the work myself. I'd gone to Budapest and Kiev, and I started doing cancer research, the cancer research I told you about. This is when I started doing it. I was hired at Semmelweis University to teach homeopathy, and because of me, homeopathy became legal for Hungary. According to the law of Hungary, somebody has to teach a medical a technique for it to be legal and I was the first one to teach homeopathy. We started doing AIDS research. I tested all of the AIDS patients of, of Hungary. This was 1993. One of the patients came to me, his name was Zoltan, and he said he wanted to talk. He wanted to step through the, the uh, uh, there's always a confidentiality, and I, he said he wanted to talk to me and tell me his name. I said, okay. So we sat down, we talked, and he said, 
he had just a couple of months to live. Didn't know what to do. We talked. I had found some incredible natural medications because of this study that work dramatically and inhibit the replication of the AIDS. And I could talk about that, but I don't have time. Any rate, we put him on that stuff. I had doctors working with him. I hadn't seen him. About four or five months ago in Budapest, I had, I'd make movies, etc., and I decided that I was going to donate money to AIDS research. And I asked my, my, uh, the people to bring in some people who worked with AIDS, uh, different organizations. In came Zoltan four months ago. Sat down. I said, Zoltan, do you remember me? He didn't recognize. I said, you were in a medical study back at Semmelweis University back in the early 90s. He goes, oh, yes. That was such a handsome, a young American medical doctor. I said, Zoltan, it was me. He goes, no, no, that was a man. <laughs> he no longer has AIDS. We now have 15 people who no longer have AIDS, thanks to this blend of different medications that I found, natural medications. We were able to register, and then in 1996, I was able to register acupuncture needles in America for the first time as medical devices. That was a big battle. I was arrested by the FDA. I haven't been back since. 1996, I was making a digital system, a, a hundred channels now. We're increasing the technology every one uh, five hundredth of a second. We built the test kit. I built digital to digital interface, t being able to uh, work with the body electric digital to the digital computer, no longer needing an analog digital converter. We didn't have to do that. I could get direct data. I discovered a way to do that. We built the test kit. We built in an extra CPU, which b then became the Skio in 2001. 200 channels, 1,500, uh, 1, and now we have 220 channels, two thousandths of a second the technology, and the devices registered in Japan, Austria, Korea, China, Mexico, South America, Brazil, many other countries, including Europe. This is the tri-vector study. What's the way out? <laughs> Escape, he told me. There we go. Over the last couple of years, we were able to do a large-scale study working with the University of Rome and the University of Padua. We did a large-scale study of the Skio. We have sold 23,000 devices worldwide over the course of the last years. We, got, we solicited therapists to work with us. We had 2,500 plus therapists work with us, seeing their patients at the end of the session, they would report whatever disease, they would send that information to us. We had 97,000 plus patients over a two-year period, over 275,000 patient visits, making this one of the largest studies of all time to show the safety and the efficacy of the system. We worked on this. The data was taken in at the University of Rome, they analyzed it. Let's see, alt, page down. You can get copies of this. We are in the process of getting this all together. 220 different diseases were reported for our analysis. And this is the system we now found we could validate and prove that the Skio does provocative allergy testing, infection, reaction testing, and immune stimulation, electroacupuncture, neurological stimulation, biofeedback, psychological interaction, muscle neurological re-education, homeopathy, injured tissue detection, dental disease, super learning, and for the very first time, bioresonance on an official document And because of that, we were able to get, whoops, wrong one. There we 
There we go. The new European document now that tells us what the system does, and you can get a copy of it. I have a couple of copies here, but I can have more of it. And basically, with the new copy listing the patents and the different work, the system is now, whoops. Yeah, there we go. The system is now recognized by Europe and several other countries to do those same things. This is the first system that has an official government European document allowing it to be used for bioresonance. It made you quiet. Post-Prandial depression. It gives you a little introduction to the work that we've done because we've wanted to consistently make a better and better technology. Now, I want to talk a little bit about water because water is a polar substance. As a polar substance, that, that means it has a tiny pole. It's a paramagnetic. The hydrogen and the oxygens make a little pole. Water, thereby, can be, is not a true liquid. Water is a liquid crystal. It becomes a complete crystal at temperatures below zero, where it becomes a solid ice. But between the temperatures of zero and 60 degrees Celsius, water has a liquid crystal polar component. After 60 degrees, it becomes a true liquid as enough kinetic energy is being displaced, so water now loses its crystal structure and becomes more of a liquid. It becomes a gas or a steam at 100 degrees Celsius. Hahnemann had started doing work with smells. He started doing work with smells. He, he would take little things and put the uh, cotton balls and have people smell it, etc. Then he found out he could use water and alcohol. If I take the coffee here, the coffee has a shape. A three-dimensional shape detected by my shape receptors in my nasal pharynx here. The shape receptors detect it. Ah, oh, coffee. That shape of coffee can be imparted into the liquid crystal, and they were thereby able to start freezing the homeopathics. We started doing this work back in the early 80s. We were able to freeze the homeopathics and detect that type of, of signature, and we could tell the difference between coffee, Apis mellificera, belladonna, all these different things. They had different types of crystalline structure. The shape could be put into it. We were able to discover that. We found a better way of doing it in the process of voltammetry analysis. This study about the voltammetry, I'll page down through it. And this basically describes some of the basic processes. We found an electrical potential voltammetric process to allow us to detect the electrical signature, the electrical shape structure of an item, to detect it in its three-dimensional fashion so that we could get an idea of the shape of that coffee even at a hundred X where there's no coffee molecules in the bottle. If the remedy has been prepared properly, we would see a shape that would be stored in the polar liquid crystal, a system to do this. Very exciting. Homeopathies, which has existed for years. And in the New England Journal of Medicine years ago, a group of scientists reviewed some of the top 108 studies of homeopathy. And they, were, they said homeopathy is real. Some of the studies didn't work. Some of the studies, they didn't find good reaction. What we were able to see is that sucrose is not polar. The sugar pill does not have the ability to store the shape. It can only get a little bit of water to carry onto it when they spray the homeopathic water onto it. 
It was not as effective. And the studies that have been done on homeopathy with water, a much greater height ability of success was found than those with the sugar pill in homeopathy. But there was a major false belief. Many people like the pills. And I came along to poo-poo that a little bit. So that's some of the work that we were able to do to show the trivector. Now that's a static trivector because the coffee now doesn't change. Now I'm able to electrically measure the patient and see the patient's reactive trivector. Because you, being alive, you do not have a static electrical shape. Your shape is changing. You are reacting with your environment. You are being drawn towards nutrition and repelled from toxins. So as we take these different shapes that we've been able to find and go into the body, we're able to detect it. And basically, when a, do when a doctor who has our machine in Canada was challenged by the Canadian government, how does they know? She said the patient reacted to worms, so she prescribed a worm medication. How did they know that? We were able to show the shape of those items and to show them the science, because that's one of the key questions that we have in this world if we're going to go forward and make our, our system as a cybernetic loop. And some of the key issues that we have to know is how do you test an item? This doctor in Canada was challenged. How did they know that item was reactive? I had to go to bat with her and, t and, and talk to those people and, and go over the science as they read the books and found out, yes, because of that, it was fine. They recognized the science that we were able to sh take those different items, get a tri-vector signature. They could understand it at a scientific level, a level of validity, a, little, a level of science, and electro a level of voltmetric analysis. Another one, the issue of legality. We have rules about what can be used in diagnosis and in therapy. We have European rules about this. We have European rules regarding education. All of this cannot be ignored. And then we have another problem, a problem of networking. Because in traditional medicine, if there's a new discovery that's made in traditional medicine, everybody knows about it in 90 days. In our business of alternative, new discoveries are made, and it could be 30 years, and people don't know of it. As there's no real forums for communication, there's no real forums for networking. I'm constantly in the rest, that's why I came here today. Because networking and, and uh, connecting and sharing and building together, this is very important. Dear Professor Nelson, I uh, thank you very much for this impressive lecture. And now we have uh, even 10 minutes for discussion. Is somebody here to ask a question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Marat, I think you speak English or German? Uh, I think English uh, to help Bill. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on the scientific background of the various measurements, how they're performed? On the patient or on the, on the item? Um, well, just technically how it is done, because I've seen people use the bands, and I've seen it equally well work without any of the connection to the patient. In this study that we did with the uh, 275,000, there was a double-blind placebo control a group of patients that were not given any therapy whatsoever. They thought, the doctor thought the therapy was going on, but the machine was disabled. So there was no subspace, no intent therapy. What you're saying without the harness. Then, uh, those same people were then retested. 
What we found from this major study is that the subspace system, the system of intent, works. That there is an ability of a system to interface with the, with the patient without an electrical connection. We found that. However, in the study, what we found is that with the harness, with the electrical connection, there was a 1,400% increase in the therapy. In other words, the harness works dramatically, dramatically, dramatically better. We do live in a non-local universe and there is an ability to, to affect things in that subspace way, but it is weak compared to the electrical harness. So you might see it working, yes. If it doesn't, and it might, on a healthy patient, it might be just completely adequate. But the sicker the patient, the more they might need that electrical harness, because the harness works better. Did I answer your question? Okay, in the harness? Okay, the harness is going to be measuring very subtle changes of your voltage amperage resistance, giving us indications of capacitance, inductance, uh, reactance, sesemens, all different types of electrical parameters that are being analyzed and detected. 220 different electrical factors are being measured every two thousandths of a second. So now we can see change. We can see changes in the body. And since we're measuring the body electric at all these different poles, we're able to see global changes or specific changes and how they happen. And since the body reacts so quickly, we're able to do this very, and other than that, it would take a long time to answer it distinctly. But that's what we're doing, we're measuring, we're measuring the body electric and then interfacing with the body electric. Let me ask one other thing. What I've noticed is that you do a measurement and then something changes and it's very difficult to get repeatability of any of the parameters. How can we get greater repeatability with your device? So how would you explain that? Uh, there's a basic law of fractals. Uh, things just don't repeat. If I were to take an analysis of, of your voice and you said your name a hundred times, there will be a slightly different reaction. This is the law of fractal dynamics. Things do not repeat perfectly. In the, in the testing, we're also doing therapy. If I'm testing your body with vitamin C, I'm helping your body to correct on it. The natural system would be designed, we would see these changes. Now, there's a lot of systems out there that are really taking their values from the date of the computer, from the patient's name, and we found that some of these systems, if we change the date in the computer, completely different results came up. Because that's where they were getting their subspace data, not from the patient, but from numerical information in the computer. And by changing the date, replicability was gone. In other words, that replicability was a lie. I don't know what objectivity defined. If you do a study, as you have done with apparently yes. this Italian group, and you're classifying things according to disease properties, I assume there is some stability in the disease classification. Oh yes, There's, uh, and that, that's, that comes out of the study, and that, that's uh, something we find that certain diseases are more, uh, are more replicable, other diseases aren't. So the total conclusions, we're just getting started. I'm hoping within the next couple of months to have that much better. Mm -hmm. But there is certain disease states that are very replicable, and there's certain other disease states that are not. So, you know, that's, it's hard for a practitioner to see if you get something coming up on the computer screen repeatedly in different ways, how we can classify that in our... Well, if you see it coming up repeatedly, that means there's something there, mm -hmm. if it's repeated. But if it's, uh, if it's not repeated, it might just be topical, it might just be uh, momentary. So but that's, what, that's, that's the skill of the system, is being able to find a practitioner.